Hafa Day Fanatu listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Fanatu. Did you miss me? I know you did. I know I'm just so lovable. I miss you too. Or maybe I didn't. Eh? Eh, well, stop. I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna. You know what? The episode's over. Uh, <laughs> um, if you hear a car in the background, if I didn't know how to edit it out, that's just. We're just gonna call it ambiance. We're gonna call it um, real world. Um, background noise, and we're gonna pretend that someone's car is not being stolen. That's a house alarm, actually. A- oh my gosh. Um, a crime? Didn't see one. <laughs> I didn't see it. Didn't I hear it. I cannot see it happening. I literally cannot see that the next house, but um, we're gonna pretend that's not there and continue with this episode. And today we have a great episode with two amazing people, right? Two fun, knowledgeable amazing people. But before I introduce them, I just want to um, say thank you again for coming back. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to give us a like, share this episode, share it with your friends, your nana, your tata, your co-worker, your neighbor down the street. Check up on them. Check on your neighbors, guys. They might, Their house might be getting broken into. You never know. Or they might have been dead for three days. <laughs> been dead for three days. And you don't know that. Check on your neighbors, you know? Let me go. I'm going to go check on my neighbor real quick. Okay. We are at her house, so she will be checking on her neighbor. <laughs> Curious what's going on over there. Um, but yeah, um, don't forget to like, comment, share this, um, this episode on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you may find us. We're also on Spotify. We are uploading the episodes as fast as we can. We're still getting there. So thanks for being patient. And then I think we're also on Apple. Um, This is a question I should know. Are we on Apple? You know what? Why don't you look and find out? Um, It'll be a surprise. Let me know. Because I forgot. (laughs) Um, But, and also, more importantly, don't forget to check out our Patreon page. So, patreon.com slash fanatsu. We have a lot of amazing content. We have a lot of layers. You could donate even just a dollar a month can unlock um, secret readings, history lessons. We have um, Manny Cruz with his own monthly podcast over there, Patreons only. Chamara ASMR, you know, we have something so unique over there. Chamara ASMR, you guys, you guys fans? Because I am, and you'll love it. Uh, We have Chamara and conception a bunch of other people and we're constantly growing so check us out uh and thank you all for the support so um i probably should have done this in the beginning um the very beginning before i said all those things and i just opened my mouth and let words come out but my name is annie faye camacho for those that you don't <laughs> that don't know me <laughs> um i am the co-chair for independent guahan's media and solidarity committee so every month i come on here and I bring a special guest. I have a special episode of the month where I just talk to whoever it is I find interesting. And today, the most interesting people on my mind are Hasis and Simone. So I'm going to let them take it away and introduce themselves. So, Hasis? Okay. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Hasis Luhan. I am a middle school teacher. I teach tomorrow at a Antoine Middle School. Um, 25 years old. I'm in the Micronesian Studies program at UOG. I'm also um, taking classes at GCC under the program that uh, Simone created um, for uh, Chamorro teachers, for us to um, hone our skills in teaching the language, and et cetera. Um, what else can I say? I'm, my dad's side is from Barragata, the Luhans, Kapili. My mom's side is uh, from Saipan and Zotnia. Uh, Saipan, uh, Cabrera family, and Zotnia, the Pangolinan family. Um, Where in Barragata? Uh, San Antonio, in between Happy Mart and Antoine Middle School. Mm, okay. That area. Yeah. My family's from Barragata too. Oh, so. Don't tell me you guys are cousins. We're yeah. cousins, yeah. <laughs> it's a running joke is that I'm related to everyone. Everybody. Yeah. Literally, anytime I'm out with Jesus, we can walk in the door and be like, oh, I gotta say hi to my cousin. I'm like, how? How is it? How are we at Payless? How are we at a club? How are we at the beach? And you always have a cousin. You know, what's funny is that um, I would make fun of my grandmother for that, and then now I've become her, because now I know who every, all of my cousins are, and they are everywhere, all the yeah. time. Yeah, so, that's enough about me. Simone? 
Uh, so my name is Simone uh, Bollinger. I'm Family in Bonu, the Paris family from Barragata. Um, more in the Ville, though, like Halagwek, that road there, um, <clears throat> closer to the church than Sousa's family. But um, I am 39 now, so I've been working with the Chamorro language or with educating teachers or educating writers. Um, for about 12 years now, I've been back on Guam. I <clears throat> grew up here, but left for college and then was gone for 10 years and then came back and started at GCC right away. <clears throat> and I'm now involved in a nonprofit called Tatugi Motna, which supports literary communities on Guam, um, which we find kind of shifts more and more like everything in my life towards education. So we're working finishing up a project now that was working with language arts teachers to create a book. So that will be <clears throat> ready in December. Look out for that. Um, it's a book of teacher essays. Uh, I'm an English uh, assistant professor at GCC. I'm the department chair right now, uh, which is what's allowed me to create the program that they were talking about um, and work with a lot of stakeholders <clears throat> and gatekeepers uh, in terms of Chamorro language and education and um, and also been on my own journey for the last about 10 years to getting better at speaking tomorrow, which is my mom's first language. Her whole family speaks tomorrow, so I grew up with it. But like a lot of people my age, um, we kind of have this mental break around or stigma around speaking tomorrow, you know, rooted in shame, like everything else. Um, and so overcoming that um, is something that I've kind of been working on too for a long time. Thanks so much. And another thing I should have said in the very beginning of this episode is what the episode's about. <laughs> Let us know. Yeah. Um, if you haven't guessed it already, today we're talking about more language and um, Hissus and Simone are here because they have very interesting perspectives in my opinion. I think we do we do a lot of Chamorro language episodes um, here on the podcast, and I just wanted to highlight an, an, another um, perspective of Chamorro language. So, of course, like we said, Hassos here is um, in um, middle school teaching middle schoolers Chamorro, and then Simone, she gave us all her things that she's doing with the um, Chamorro language there at GCC. And before we really get into kind of um, the work you guys are doing, um, I want to start by just talking generally about your thoughts on Chamorro language. I think um, one of the things you just said in your intro alone, it's already I'm kind of like interested to hear more about um, when you were saying um, kind of like their perspective or attitude of like shame or all the other stuff you're saying. You, was I, did I get that right? Did you, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I feel like Chamorro when I was growing up was used to scold a lot with the kids. Mm -hmm. My dad's mm -hmm. howly, so in my own family, we didn't, in my house, we didn't, my mom didn't speak Chamorro to us. Mm -hmm. But at grandma's house on the weekends, summers, birthday parties, everything, my whole, the rest of my family all spoke Chamorro. Mm -hmm. And so my cousins speak a lot more Chamorro than I do because they were still speaking within their homes. Their parents still spoke it. Um, and for a lot of them, even my cousins, it was a first language at home. And so for me, getting scolded, uh, commands, you know, like sweep the floor, like keep still, be quiet, get away. Yeah. Those, you know, were early kind of onset um, <clears throat> language that I was exposed to and then also you know like my mom and my aunties when we would do something wrong and I think I was in trouble a lot they would talk about what you did in Chamorro and you knew that they were talking about you mm -hmm. and you knew to feel shame because you did something uh, but you didn't really know what they were saying right right and and that didn't exactly open up the door to love or interest or wanting to learn the Chamorro language right. I remember my mom stuck me in Chamorro classes they we didn't have them in my school but she put me in Chamorro classes when I was young, and I didn't have a, a strong interest to learn the language. So when I did try to say stuff later, I think, you know, 
I was sensitive already to Chamorro language usage, but then, you know, when you say something wrong and someone corrects you in a harsh way or, you yeah. know, it just kind of makes you not want to keep trying. And so I think it's just a complicated psychological situation. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm fluent in Spanish. I, I studied Spanish in high school and I lived in Mexico for three years. And so I didn't have that same experience with the Spanish language, right. which, you know, tells me that it is something unique to my experience here with the Chamorro language and in my family. Yeah. No, I, I really get that. I didn't really think of it until now that just like a lot of the negative is something that kind of really sticks to you more with the language. Like, um, I'm thinking of the times I speak Chamorro the most. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of to my dog. <laughs> I speak to more than most of my dog. Because I'll just be like, if she's barking, I'll just be like, Aaliyah, bust that out. <laughs> you know, I'll just like, I like, um, it's funny. My, my dog knows tomorrow commands more than she knows like English commands, you know, and that's kind of because that's um, what I give her and of course i'm not trying to like compare our dogs to our children but you know i'm just saying i'm just saying you know um but jesus what was like um how did you become like fluent in the language was it your first language it was not my first language it wasn't even my second language i actually also learned spanish too before mm -hmm. i learned tomorrow so i grew up most i was born in guam i lived here till i was seven and then i moved to the states and um, we moved around a lot but basically i took spanish in high school and that was my actually my second language and then um, that kind of primed me for learning Chamorro later on so uh, I'm I think I kind of have an affinity for languages I, I tend to pick them up pretty easily and so I was and I'm, I think about language in a very grammatical sense mm -hmm. so as I try to learn it in a way where I can be as creative with it as possible right so I try to break things down and you know, translate them as much as I can so that I can use the language, you know, more fluid, more fluently, right? Rather than learning like phrases and stuff. So I took that, I took my fluency in Spanish and the way that I was able to break things down. And then as I was like leaving high school already, my mom had these, these Chamorro books, Chamorro textbooks that were written by Topping, right? Mm -hmm. She, my mom is a fluent Chamorro speaker, but she did take Chamorro at UOG when she was getting her degree. So she she still had those books she held on to them and then i read them a couple of times uh just like i would read it and then put it down for like a year and then come back to it and read it again and after a couple of times doing that i finally had the confidence and had at least the enough structure to start speaking so that i, I started to speak to my mom and she would respond back to me as a child i always wanted to learn chamorro but my mom didn't want to teach me chamorro she didn't think it was useful so that was kind of I had to go about it on my own, you know, and I had to use the tools that were available to me at the time. Because even, you know, living in the States, um, the only two more people I knew were my family. So it's not like I could go to school and just like talk to people, you know, and stuff like that. I kind of had to talk to myself first, <laughs> kind of like try to, you know, visualize things in the language. And then as I built confidence, I was starting to speak to my mom, started to speak to my grandma. And that's when I really understood, you know, that um, the rhythm of the language, accent, stuff like that. Um, that's what really helped me probably the most is finally, you know, all the practice that I got later on when I was learning. So I really, I'm 25 now. I probably wasn't fluent in the language until maybe 21, 22. And that's starting to learn maybe around like 15 or 16, but like very gradually at first. Yeah. It's funny because learning Spanish, the way I was taught Spanish was through grammar too. Yeah. And so once you learn a language through grammar, it, you're, you're tuned in to the, to the points of language that indicate like past tense, present tense, feminine or masculine, if it's Spanish, certain right. things, right? Yeah. And so it becomes easier to learn languages after that yeah. in that same way, because you're like, oh, I want to change tense. So what's my tense marker? Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's one thing I feel like I have a very strong theoretical Mm -hmm. understanding of Chamorro mm -hmm. like I can explain grammatical things right but that doesn't necessarily help me <clears throat> to, speak, right. to speak because I, I need more practice right. speaking yeah you have to think about it first yeah. yeah I have to translate exactly yeah 
Yeah, because theoretical, like, really only gets you so far, right? Like, reading the books, doing mm-hmm. all of that. I think that's one of the things with, like, um, fluency. I think I, I, saw, I forgot where I saw it, but I was just, like, reading. Oh, wait, why am I? Mm, no, I wasn't reading. I'm not going to lie. I think it was a TikTok. Now that I think back on it, okay. it was a TikTok. And um, it was a TikTok where about um, this this woman talking about um, saying she was like making the stance that no one's fluent in anything. Um, and I was like, OK, I was just like, OK, I'm going to keep watching because I was like, what do you mean? No one's fluent in anything. Okay. But it's like um, she was just like saying like, OK, you're fluent in English. But like how much of like science kind of. Um, jargon do you know how much of this do you know people are fluent in um, kind of um, life situations uh-huh. is what she was trying to say what she, I think what she's talking about is what's called tier three words yeah so there in in language there are three different tiers of words the first tier is things like dog cat happy sad then the second tier is stuff like uh, like but so and like grammatical stuff and also like kind of more um, Stuff that you might have to teach, right? If you're like an ESL teacher, the third stuff is things like mechanical words or like jargon, things like that, like uh, molecule or like um, you know phosphorus, things like that. So I think she's trying to create some kind of distinction. Like you have to know all of the jargon in a language in order to be fluent in the language. I think she was just. I I think um she was mainly trying to just talk about um the fact that um there's just so many facets to language and there's just like so much like um like the idea of like place-based learning or like all this other stuff like um like how do I explain this like um okay well I'm a therapist right how many people know like I think I have a lot of kids right and yeah they're fluent in English but they don't know anything there I have kids that don't know anything about like emotions I see right so it's just like um, if I were to show them like an emotion word, they didn't, they wouldn't understand like what, like, um, surprise or agitate or something looks like. And it's not because of like, um, um, it's, it's not because it's a big word, but it's because it's a word that, um, isn't used for them. If you know what I mean? Like, um, you learn language according to what you need to know. Okay. That's interesting what Sus is saying about place based because I think about when what you're ta- what she's what this TikTok is is talking about is like in order when you read like we study reading comprehension that's my my background is in language and literacy and so to truly comprehend what you're reading you need to know like 95% of the words so if you're reading a medical textbook and you're not <clears throat> in medicine you don't know, you're not really comprehending mm-hmm. because you don't know what a lot of these words are. Right. And so when we think about place-based learning and we think about, let's talk about like SATs or the tests that they, those, you know, these like generic broad tests that they're taking, they're all using the language that belongs to another context, the United States. Mm-hmm. So when we take those tests and we're not familiar with those contexts, not only for the language, Mm-hmm. but also for the background knowledge, which is another huge thing in reading comprehension. Mm-hmm. If I don't know what it's like to sit in a giant, and I use this from personal experiences, like a giant baseball stadium, mm-hmm. and what kind of happens, like the first time I went to a baseball game and everyone stood up to sing, they like, take me out to the ball game. I knew that song, but I had no idea that it was used. I didn't know what context it fit in. I didn't know that everyone was going to stand up in the middle of the game and sing this song. So if I'm to be tested on something that includes that type of knowledge, words that I'm not familiar with, which is baseball, for example, I know I played softball, but I don't really know much about. So there's vocabulary that I'm not familiar with. And then there's also background knowledge that I don't know. And now I got to read something and you're going to test me. Did I comprehend it? Well, no, I didn't really comprehend it. But is it because I'm not, you know, I don't I don't have good reading comprehension skills? No. It's because what you tested me on had aspects that didn't apply to me, didn't apply to my life that wasn't language and background information that I'm used to. And so this move to place-based, culturally relevant pedagogy, there's lots of words for it, right, is really that idea that you're testing us and teaching us on things that we don't experience when we're young. 
So you're not really testing if we have the skills to be able to, in right. ca this case, comprehend what we're reading. You're right. testing us on, do we have that experience? And no, we don't. So okay. no, we're not going to do as well on these tests. I see. Yeah. The criteria has to be different. The criteria has to be different. The tests have to be different. What we're reading to learn com reading comprehension, the books we're reading, have to be different. They have to be local literature. Right. They have to be so kids can work on the skill of reading comprehension without having to learn background knowledge that they don't know. Right. They can say, oh yeah, I know what it's like to, I know what the mango tree looks like. I'm right. familiar with it. I know all the leaves that it puts out. Right. So now you, you're teaching me, you can focus on the skill that you want. You can teach me the skill you want me to get, which right. is the reading comprehension skills mm -hmm. without me not knowing lots of other things that are not tied to reading, comp or that are not part of what you're trying to teach me. Right. And then you'll be better, you'll be more effective at teaching and learning because you've reduced the cognitive load of what needs to be taught down to the reading comprehension skills. Right, right. Which is what you're trying to do, right? That's your standard or that's your whatever. Right. And so local literature, that's why it's so important. That's why local curriculum is so important. Right. That's why a local education system is so important. Mm -hmm. Because I always say, like, you take a rectangle shaped system and you put it on the star of who we are and we're not going to go through it's like that kid game you know where you put the blocks through the, sh the shapes through the holes that fit it's not it's not going to fit and so I think that's one of the issues with our education system on Guam and in lots of places actually it's not a system that works for the demographics for the culture for the experiences for right. the environment that the people live in and experience mm -hmm. So it's not as successful. Right. That makes perfect sense. And I think it, it also contributes to the, like, a, you know, kids, they don't see themselves in, in the content at all. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, it's they're, boring. They're, they're reading about snow, yeah. right, and uh, other things, different cultures, right, which is yeah. good. But, like, you know, how about our own culture, yeah. right? That makes kids more excited to learn because they can see themselves in things, whether it's history, whether it's literature, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, I understand what you're talking about. I think also if kids are constantly seeing like in media or in school others, right, yeah. people from outside, then they think that nothing is here, yeah. right? They think that everything is elsewhere. And that's such a big, you know, a big uh, talking point that people always have, you know, when you get in, talk to people, you know, in Guam. It's like everyone thinks, oh, you know, nothing, there's nothing here, yeah. right? But it's like, is it that there's nothing here or is that that we don't, we don't even bother to look at look what's at here? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? No, I, I like what you guys are talking about because, like, you know, um, like, you, you got me thinking about, like, when I was, like, you know, in the in the public school system and I would read about um, a, a redwood forest, you know? I, I don't think I've seen, like, a, you know, just the, the word for it itself, right? Then I have to do, like, like, for kids, you would have to do, like, more background thinking, being like, okay, what... What does a forest look like? You can see the picture, but I'm like, mm, maybe I'll translate it in my head. In forest, I'll just correlate it with jungle. And then now I could start reading this. You know, so there's a lot of background thinking that has to go into like just. And so you're not actually comprehending what you're reading. You're thinking about, you're using your own background knowledge. Right. But that's not what the author, the writer is trying to get across. Right. You're missing it. Right. So let me test you on it now. Right. Are you going to get a high score? Yeah. You know. Right. But then, um, uh, what is it? I, I, I love what you guys are saying right now, especially kind of like this is a great segue into another thing I want to talk about is um, you guys as educators, right? So we have, I think you guys are kind of great because you have the, um, the public school system, right? You have the middle school perspective and then Simone has the teaching the teacher perspective. So you guys both have um, a sense of kind of, just the broad the broad look of Chamorro education on Guam so it's just like you've been you, you've you been teaching you've been teaching for you know some I mean you're 25 so you know if I say a while it doesn't really mean a lot to some people but you know you've been you've been teaching for a bit yes right the Chamorro language so what what's your um general perspective of how it's been like um you could take it any this question any way you want. How's it going? Yeah, like how's it going? Like how's it going? Um, maybe like just how the kids are receptive to it, but also maybe something like you find that's a struggle not just for the kids but for you as a teacher sure. too, right? Sure. 
Um, how do I begin? Um, how about your first impression of like coming into like the Chamara education, you know, starting teaching? Like, what was the first thing you kind of noticed as like strong points or weak points or things you didn't even think were going to be there, but were? I see. Okay. Um, well, for the Chamorro teacher, right? We, we have books that we can use as a textbook, sure. But for the most part, the Chamorro teacher is the textbook. The Chamorro mm -hmm. teacher has to provide, has to create their own lessons, right? There's no like, you can buy, you can buy science, English, math te textbooks online, right? And they're, they're full of like, activities and yeah. stuff to do. Chamorro is kind of still developing. And so it, we have to create our own lessons. And there's so much diversity in how Chamorro teachers make their lessons. There's so many different kinds of lessons, right? And each teacher has their own way. So that's the biggest, probably the biggest thing is that it's not something where I can just go in and I can have no training and, you know, I can just like read from a book, a lesson, and then give them activity and that's it. It's very much, I have to create the lesson myself. I have to think about the grammar that they're going to learn, the vocabulary they're going to learn, and also the cultural content that they're going to learn, learn and try to put it into a lesson that's coherent, right? And that's like um, <clears throat> digestible for the kids. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's so hard to teach a language. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, in, in high school, in, even in the United States, right? Everyone has to take a language, but do all those people come out fluid in that language? I think you and I are, are, you know, a very small group of people that actually... Hey, not in the United States, that's for sure. Exactly. But even here in Guam, you know, it's like any, anywhere that people take language, if they're only taking it for like an hour a day, um, and it's only, you know, a certain amount of years, more often than not, they're not going to come out fluent in the language. Yeah. So the challenge is that so many Chamorro teachers like myself have a dream of creating fluent language speakers. But there are a lot of things that are working against us. Firstly, the amount of time that we get teaching. I don't teach in elementary school, but in some elementary schools, the kids only get like 30 minutes a day of tomorrow language. And you might say, you know, anything can happen. Do the best you can with those 30 minutes. But the, the, the fact of the matter is we need more time. If we want to accomplish that dream of creating tomorrow language speakers, we need to go about it differently. We need to create more time so that the kids can accomplish this goal, right? And we need to almost completely rethink how we teach it. The second thing is, of course, you know, I wasn't a really good student in school. I didn't want to be there in, in high school. I was already thinking about how can I get out of this, right? And so I'm in middle school now, but a lot of the kids are already like that, right? They're not interested in learning anything whatsoever. Yeah. They're, they're not here to learn. They're here to hang out and gossip, right? So it's like, how do we, how do I change their minds? Or how do I make it so easy that they can do it and they don't even think that they're learning? How can they gossip in tomorrow? Right, right. How can you harness that energy and use it to my own goal, right? Which mm -hmm. is to make them fluent in language. So a lot of things have to go well in order for you to learn a language, right? You have to be motivated. Um, if you don't care, then you won't learn it. Because learning a language is hard. It requires a lot of mental effort, especially if you're not, you, if you're not a baby anymore, right? Things just don't, they don't come as easily as before. Secondly, kids, um, they have to have a lot of practice. And that's the issue with time is that a lot of times they, they don't have enough practice. Or a lot of times I have to say that, you know, some teachers teach in a certain way that isn't really conducive to learning the language, right? They might be mean yeah. or they might be, um, they might be focusing on the wrong things or they might not be really speaking the language much in the class at all. They might be mostly focusing on culture because they think that kids don't want to learn language, right? That it's too hard to teach a language. So that, and then, um, Probably a couple of other things that I'm missing, but motivation is probably the biggest one. Like for the, the story of myself, mostly what I had was motivation, right? If there was a will, there was a way for me. So that's probably the, the most important thing. And then obviously you need your resources, you need practice as well. So that those are the kind of things that I'm up against <laughs> for uh, the, the work that I do. But I will say that in every class, there are kids that love the Chamorro language that are soaking it up like a sponge and I cannot keep up with them. That's maybe a third of the class or more sometimes. Kids that are dying to learn the language, right? Because they see the need and they love the language and they love learning about their self, right? And they have a good teacher. Oh. 
that, like you said, that does make all the difference. Yes, it does. Definitely, it does make a, a big difference. There are obviously kids that, you know, they don't care. And that could be in many forms. The Chamorro kids that don't care, right? But they, they don't care about any subject. Or maybe they don't care about Chamorro in particular. Maybe because they don't have a good relationship with their family. And it reminds them of their family. Or maybe, um, and then there are also kids who aren't Chamorro. And they don't care about learning Chamorro. And I don't blame them. Because, you know, I don't really care about learning Swedish. So it's like, what is, what is the relevancy yeah. to me? But I, I tell those kids, you know, as a, it's a respect thing. You know, we're here on Chamorro land, okay? We have to honor the people who, you know, whose land we're living on, whether, whether you are part of that group or not. And I think that that kind of grace should be extended everywhere you go, right? You should have an interest, so you should at least have respect for um, the native people of whatever land you're living in. So that's, yeah. that's the one thing that I can offer those kids that, that don't care and they're not Chamorros that, you know, if I go to Chuk or if I go to Palau or if I go to Philippines, I'm going to take an interest in the culture and I'm going to respect the culture and the people. Right? Because it's not my land and I'm a guest here. That's that's what I say. So um yeah, those are pretty much the main challenges. Yeah, but they're I mean, they're also pretty big challenges, right? Yeah. I think um like how you're saying, like the teacher is the curriculum. Yes. Right? It also kind of talks about um it also kind of discusses this other kind of issue of like, okay, with reading, right? When you get to second grade, you're expected that your first grade teacher taught you this, your kindergarten teacher taught you this. When you're in high school, like there's already an expectation that you should know this, but because the teachers are the curriculum, there's no like, you know, when you're in eighth grade middle school, you should be able to like conjugate, like there's no expectation, right? And you don't know, there's, you don't know what their last teacher told you until you ask them. Right. Unfortunately, I have to, and I'm not trying to talk, you know, poorly of any Chamorro teachers in elementary school or whatnot, but it's just so, the kids are learning so many different things. Some kids are coming to me and they don't know what Hafa means. They don't know what, you know, basic stuff. So I have to start my class assuming they know nothing at all, which is good because it's an equalizer, right? We're all starting from the bottom, but there are some kids, maybe one out of every class, so maybe one out of every 30 kids, they have some background in the language. Maybe they went to Harao cultural camp, or maybe their grandpa speaks to them and, and in Chamorro and they live with their grandpa. So it's like, you get all kinds of kids, but yeah, that's the thing is that like in, in middle school with math, kids know how to add, subtract, divide, multiply, right? By middle school. In Chamorro class, there's just not enough continuity where I can really say that the kids know anything at all when they get to my class. So that, that also makes it harder because there's less, for most kids, there's less um, context for me to build on, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember in elementary, I think the one, the only thing I really remember doing in elementary was learning a lot of songs. I still remember them by heart and I, lo I will sing them along, you know, but, um, you know, I, I agree, you know, every kind of year the teacher even all the way you know to even when you have to do like tomorrow in high school right or um your teacher is always like trying to find everyone's baseline but everyone's different because like maybe your middle school teacher wanted to focus on um just um cultural aspects not actual language right or this teacher focused on dance right. more than they focused on um culture right. so it's like um it's hard. I feel like it. I feel like like from what you're talking about too. It's just like, um, every year it's kind of like um. I guess a game and a remaking of curriculum versus like if you were in English, like of course, like um, you do make your curriculum every year, but in some sense, it's kind of similar to what you did last year. Right. I kind of have a different perspective on that. Okay. So one of the because this is true, right? When we have standards and we expect that standards are met so that you can build upon what was ha what was done before, mm -hmm. if those standards aren't met, if there isn't that type of continuity, right. it's very difficult. Yeah. One of the things that we're doing with this Chamorro education program is we're trying to, well, the, the approach that we're taking, ideally, if mm -hmm. it goes well, kind of resolves those a lot of those issues. Right. 
And I'll just say that this, the reason that I'm in this, right, is because when I lived in Mexico, I did a month-long program certification to be a teacher English of English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And that was the only place, like you mentioned, students take language classes, but they're not necessarily fluent. Mm -hmm. That was the only school that I worked at. It was, it was, I was getting certified, but they had a language, an English language school mm -hmm. where you walked in there and students were speaking English. Uh, it was amazing. Right. It was the, it was just mind blowing to me because I'd never, I didn't think you could really learn a language in a school. I, did, I didn't really think that based mm -hmm. on my experience. I was, I wasn't fluent from learning high school or Spanish in high school and in college. That's not where it came from. So the method that they taught us was the immersion method. Right. And they had a very specific type of curriculum. You're introducing eight to 10 words a day, no more. You're setting up a context for those words. So those words have to be found within the context. Mm -hmm. You're only, we could only speak English. We couldn't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. and, and then they had like, you know, start with a dialogue, you do this, but really the students need to be practicing. They need to be hearing you. Every day for a week, the same song would be played like randomly in the middle of the class. Everyone had to stop. We all had the lyrics we had to sing. Mm -hmm. So um, that really opened my eyes that really teaching a language doesn't have to be difficult. Mm -hmm. Teaching grammar and linguistics, a linguistic approach to teaching language is difficult. Right. And that's how, unfortunately, that's how we're set up in the U.S. even most places, right? Mm -hmm. And on Guam. Right. But if you're using the immersion method, I, there's something beautiful about the teacher being the curriculum. Mm -hmm. There's something beautiful about you having experience in chant right. or, um, you know, cooking right. or weaving mm -hmm. and bringing that to the class mm -hmm. and sharing what your expertise or your experience is. That's beautiful. I love right. that. Right. But... If you if if you have to do that around linguistic or around grammar, it's going to be difficult. Right. It's going to be a challenge, and actually, you'd need to be trained in how to teach the grammar, right? Right. right. Um, a lot of teachers, a lot of Chamorro teachers, don't have a background in language teaching. Right. And so, but if you're using the immersion method, mm -hmm. then you're sharing whatever it is that your expertise is in mm -hmm. in Chamorro. Right. And the expectation would be that when they go to their next class. That teacher continues that and shares whatever it is that their expertise is in. But the idea is you're walking out with basic fluency. Right. And so what we did at GCC is um, we moved the Chamorro classes into the English department, partially because that's where I am and I wanted to do that, mm -hmm. but also because it makes sense to have the two official languages of Guam under an umbrella of literacy, right? right? And so um, we moved them in, and then I had the course guides, and I'm like, and we're teaching this by grammar. Exactly. Yeah. And and so we changed it. The SLOs, the student learning outcomes, are like you can understand basic question and questions in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You can answer basic questions. You can describe yourself in basic ways. So no longer do we have like transitive, intransitive, you know, right. vowel fronting. We don't have those as part of the course guide anymore. Mm -hmm. We have you're gonna enter this class and you're gonna speak tomorrow mm -hmm. because and then, so we did that for Chamorro 1, Chamorro 2, mm -hmm. and now we created four new classes. Mm -hmm. The first one, the one that Sus is in, is the Immersion Method. Mm -hmm. That class is amazing. It's all in Chamorro. Right. So I don't know of any other post-secondary. I think Robert Underwood taught a Chamorro history class in Chamorro, or maybe he does that periodically, right? I only remember him teaching it once, but I that was a few years ago. I don't remember the last time he offered it. So other than that, where can you go to get specific, and, and if you don't have family or other areas where they speak tomorrow, to get that immersion experience of having to use it, um, you know, it, it's unique. And so we, we focused our tomorrow 1 and tomorrow 2, and we're working on tomorrow 3 and tomorrow 4, to be immersion classes because we want you to, we want our students to be prepared to walk into immersion methods class right. with Anne Marie Arceo she's the, the the instructor and sit for an hour and a half for two two days a week mm -hmm. and learn content right in tomorrow right. teaching content mm -hmm. so I'll let you talk about what you guys are doing in that class and the you know but it's it's I mean that's a totally different shift mm -hmm. and I just I love that you said the teacher is the curriculum, the teacher is the textbook, because that doesn't have to be 
a bad thing. Right. But yeah. right now, it is a, it it presents yeah. a major challenge. Yeah. But that we should we should use that for right. the beauty that that is. Yeah. But we have to really rework yeah. the system. We have to rework what teachers are doing and what that continuity looks like. Because there are standards, right? Mm-hmm. Chamorro Chamorro yeah. studies at GDO. There are standards. Right. But everyone has this. Everyone talks about this. Everyone talks about. They come to my class and they still don't know colors. Mm-hmm. So I have to start with colors. Mm-hmm. So every year the students are getting the same content. They're right. getting colors. They're getting mm-hmm. uh, the alphabet. They're getting basic Chamorro every single year, and they don't really necessarily yeah. progress beyond that right, right. because the teacher can't expect them to right. come in with more than that. Right. They have to start. Mm-hmm. And so for us, the approach we're taking at GCC with this program is to really just steamroll mm-hmm. what's being done, right. erase it, and rebuild right. from the teacher perspective. Right. How the teachers walking in will say, I want my students to walk out being able to have a basic conversation, Mm -hmm. being able to basically introduce themselves, Mm -hmm. be able to listen to to certain commands. And some of this is being done. It's not like, especially with commands, I know that's actually part of the standards. They have to know basic like like questions like, can I go to the bathroom? Can I drink water? Mm -hmm. Right? That's part of the curriculum. Right. Um, But that's that's the approach we're taking. And and it's, it's not... It's a it's a unique approach on Guam and in a lot of places in the U.S. But if you look at Japan, they're not learning English in Japanese in their classes. Mm -hmm. They're learning English in English. That's why if you teach English, you could go to Japan. They're going to set you up. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We've all heard like they they room and board. They uh, pay really well. All of that. You're treated like a professional in lots of other countries. That's how they teach whatever language they want to teach. That's why people are fluent in English mm-hmm. from other countries. Right. That's part of it. Another part of it is that English, there's a motivation right. because there it's the lingua language. franca. Right. Because there's movies mm-hmm. and songs mm-hmm. and all of this stuff. My niece, she loves K-pop. She's learning Korean. Her mm-hmm. motivation is because she likes that culture. Right. And so I think to, to bring back to your point earlier too is, what is the motivation to learn tomorrow if you're tomorrow or if you're not tomorrow? Right. right now, what we have is respect. Mm-hmm. You live here. This is a native people. And that right. is very legitimate. Right. But I don't know if that's enough for all students. Right. Especially if respect is not a value that is really harped upon within their home cultures. Mm-hmm. Right. Respect for others, respect for the land, respect for the ocean, mm-hmm. things like that. Right. Yeah. And so how do we make Guam make Chamorro culture, make the Marianas something that has this interest, that motivate, that there's this intrinsic motivation for students to be, to look at it. And I think part of that question, again, is to look at the curriculum. If our science curriculum was about our trees and about things that they could actually observe and things that they could actually do, Mm -hmm. wouldn't that bring more attention to the island and to the unique features of our forest, of our jungle, of our mangroves of our limestone forests, right? right? So when we have threats to limestone forests, for example, or to the water, now the people can talk about it. The people know they've experienced it. They care. It's been even formalized within their education. Mm -hmm. Wow. How many more people are going to be interested when we want to, you know, cut down thousands of acres? Right for detonation and for you know what I mean yeah right now it's a small pocket that really cares about it Mm -hmm. it's so sad right Mm -hmm. but part of that I would say part of the 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 reason that that's such a that that is a specific pocket of people that care is because our education system doesn't teach us to care about our own environment my daughter was learning about the four seasons in in kindergarten (laughs) and I'm like do you know the two seasons on Guam though yeah. You know that we have rainy right. and dry season. And so a lot of that is us as families reteaching. Right. Like, let's observe. What what's, what do we learn about? There's mosquitoes. We, we're doing mosquito coil. Tomorrow ASMR, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> like, these are things that we need to know and that they're, they are season specific. In the dry yeah. season, we could be out here and, or, you know, further in the dry season, right? We're starting to get into, it's been raining. Right. Um, and so things like that. You know, I think that these bigger societal concerns bigger areas of civic engagement Mm -hmm. where we want to vote people for people who care about the things we care about Mm -hmm. those things all can start in the education system 
right. but not this square education system on the star of who we are, you know, that that's not doing it for us. And it hasn't been working for us. We know this, right. you know. Right. Yeah, no, I, I love everything um, you were just saying, because um, I feel like um, I feel like, you know, I'm not fluent in tomorrow, you know, or I'm not close to what you guys have, like your tomorrow knowledge. Um, but just thinking about the way you guys are describing this class, I feel like it really would have um, as a kid, it really would have helped me if I had like a tomorrow kind of immersion experience. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think the first time I heard about like hurrah, I was just like. You know, as an adult, I was like jealous. I was like, "Wow, I wish, I wish I had that." Me too. Right? It's been on yeah. for eighteen years. I know. <laughs> Some of us are older. Yeah. Than... No, but <laughs> I know, but I didn't know about it. Oh, you, know? you missed it. I I missed out. <laughs> I missed out on it. But like, um, what was it? Um, but like it, it's true. Like we're teaching tomorrow in English, and um, like all my experiences, it was just like tomorrow like put a tomorrow word in like an English sentence and that's that's how it was like being taught just like straight vocab and then like I I think I'm very appreciative of like my tomorrow teachers you know of course I'm I mean no disrespect to them because I think I did learn a lot of like um the cultural aspects of tomorrow but um unfortunately none of the tomorrow linguistics really stuck and I feel like the ones that did stick with me are when I it where I actually didn't know what was going on and then I had to figure it out myself, you know, which would be something in immersion. If I don't know what they're saying to me, then I would like, you know, I would have to have the interest in knowing what they're saying to me. Right. You know, I would do the actual work. It would be like, yeah. well, in my mind, it's like, um, if I was a kid, I would like think, like knowing me as a kid, I would think of it as like a, a game or a puzzle. You know, I love a good puzzle, but it's like, um, from what I know of my tomorrow, the things that have stuck to me or it's like if I'm in a circle with people talking tomorrow and I'm just like, hmm, I know half of that. So what can I what can I infer about the second half, you know, from how the rest of the conversation going? And then like because I put so much thought into like what that word means and I finally figured it out, that thing's gonna stay with me now. And our brains are wired to, to pick up language. Right. They, they, like if you if you read Chomsky, it's, you know, in universal grammar, he basically says that um, children, our brains are wired to pick up and have this sort of like framework in our brains so that the grammar, the, the words, the sounds of whatever language we want can just fit into that framework that we already have. Right. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. Like you'll hear that that language is, is really a creative process of production not uh i hear you i say it i hear you i say it it's not a behaviorist kind of like mm -hmm. stimuli repeat you right. know like mm -hmm. it's like you hear kids and they'll say like i go to the store today mm -hmm. they've never heard anyone say i go right. but you can tell that their brain understands that if i'm talking in the past tense right. you put ded -E at the end of it right. and you made it past tense Right. They don't know that there's irregular words yet. Mm -hmm. They no need to tell them, oh, that's an irregular verb. Right. They just start to pick it up and learn that over time. Right. And so if you were sitting in a group of, of people, it's not even your motivation is that you don't understand. And that's universal. Yeah. Any kid sitting and doesn't understand, their brain is already starting to right. try right. to understand. I will say I'm learning this in the class. Immersion is such a delicate balance, right? And it depends on the kid too, because some kids are coming with context, right? They they speak some tomorrow already. Some kids, they don't like tomorrow. Yeah. They hear tomorrow and their mind is just turned off already. So even though they have this capacity, like you're saying, to pick up on language pretty easily, if they just believe that tomorrow is not important, tomorrow is is bad or tomorrow is not interesting. Your first goal is to change their mind. True. And that's maybe half of the job. Yeah, that is. And, you know, I don't really like being in the business of changing minds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for some groups, it definitely is easy. It's so, when you get to groups like Kurao, okay, for example, those kids, they're applying to be there. Their parents want them to be there. They come from backgrounds where their um, culture is important, right? So they're getting those messages at home, which is great. But when you're in the public school system and the kids, you know, more often than not um, have very little interest, that makes it harder. But yes, yeah. uh, in general, immersion is the, the best way 
to teach a language because it's necessary in those contexts. Because the kid needs it to understand anything that's going on. They have no idea what the heck is going on, right? So they they have to speak to the other kids in that language. Yeah. Millions of kids in the United States don't speak English at home, but when they go to kindergarten, up till yeah. sixth grade, they're fluent by what, second grade? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they need it mm-hmm. for school. Or they need it to, to, to be cool, to have friends, right? To have fun. To have fun. Right? Exactly. To me, everything boils down to having fun. Right. So we have to look at the methods that are working above anything else, above anybody's ego, yeah. above what anybody yeah. thinks makes most sense. Yeah. It's what really works to teach a language. And th- that's what we're doing in the class. And that's why I love it so much is because we're looking at how are we actually going to accomplish this goal? Yeah. You know, putting all of our egos aside, like what what really is going to work for us? So before we um, get into like talking more about like the class and like the emergent experience let's let's kind of like backtrack a little bit and so monkey tell us more about um the program itself like we've been talking about it um we've been talking about it in like bits and pieces but i think it'd be good for like um everyone that doesn't know about the program to really get um i don't know maybe like the elevator pitch or the brochure yeah even like pitch it yeah even um like maybe the you talked a little bit about the thought process of going into like combining the tomorrow to the English and like just your work at GCC, but maybe um, you could start all the way from like, just like getting started with all of this. Yeah. So first I just wanted the tomorrow classes in English because they were in the tourism department and it doesn't really make sense. They're with oh, the other cool. languages. Yeah. But tour, tour guides don't need to learn tomorrow for, you know, they need to learn Japanese or Russian or Korean. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so, um, and then, and then I've just been working with Chamorro teachers for many years. And so I said, I know Chamorro teachers. It'll be easy for me to get the adjunct pe- to to fill, to teach these classes. Mm-hmm. And so I pulled them in, or the class in, and then I revised the course guide. And then I said, you know, our in the English department, our program is the liberal studies program. And I said, and I was revising that program as well. And I said, oh, I'm going to make a Chamorro track. Then we can build more Chamorro classes, which is fun, right? We don't have a, a big... Ch- GCC is interesting. There's a very strong Chamorro culture at the, stu- at the school because a lot of the staff, a lot of the faculty, a lot of the admin are Chamorro. Mm-hmm. You can hear Chamorro at GCC. We had Chamorro... Chamorro month, we had our... We, we were doing our display in the library for that comp- the competition, right? Mm-hmm. Those meetings were in Chamorro. Like, you know, I mean, and other Gulf Guam agencies are like that as well, but I think it is unique. It is unique on Guam for higher education, right? Because we can have a, a meeting in Chamorro and everybody there. I was probably the least fluent person, but I can understand a lot. I just can't really. So, um, so anyways, so I, I really wanted to kind of center Chamorro studies or Chamorro uh classes at GCC more. And so I created a track. So it's a Chamorro um, culture and education track. Because I, I'm a teacher of teachers, I care about teaching. So, you know, I w- also was like, you know what, the big GCC, you know, we're, we're also focused on the workforce. And so I said, there's a lot of jobs, Chamorro teaching jobs. There's a need for this. There's a need for the for training. And so I said, I'm going to sort of shape it around that need. That makes sense. It's also aligned with my background in teaching non-native language, which I hate calling Chamorro on Guam. <laughs> but that's, you know, part of the, that's, there's right. your native language, which is your first language, and then uh-huh. there's a non-native language. It doesn't really work for us here, but just take that out. Pretend I didn't say non-native language because I didn't really, it doesn't match. But, um, and so we now had a track, a liberal studies track for Chamorro education and culture. And now I needed eight classes. I need to build eight classes. And around that time, um, I started working with Anne-Marie Arceo from Haral. Haral is amazing. And so I started getting her to teach Chamorro one. I said, I, I changed it to make it immersion. Can you teach it? Can we, you know, she said, of course, she's so amazing. Her passion for perpetuation is like no other. Unta- uh, yeah, yeah, is unmatched. And so she said, of course, I'll do it. And she even was teaching Chamorro 2 for a while. This was right before the pandemic. Um, and so she and I started working in that capacity together. And I said, hey. Um, and then she was also the director of the Commission at the time. Mm-hmm. And so the, the COVID hit. Then there were just, there was, you know, kind of things happened. And then there was an A&A grant that the Commission was going to apply for. And so 
Anne-Marie was there, Laura Souders there, um, Auntie Hope is there, Rosa Palomo, uh, Jimmy Terrier, who's the GDO8, right? Um, I feel like I want to name them all because they've all been part of, you know, this process. Um, and uh, Teresita Flores, who I love too. She's so sweet. Um, and they and and so they actually were like, we want to do a certificate for tomorrow teachers. And they said, we'll base it at GCC. So I said, perfect. These four classes, I'm already I already had the immersion methods class built. I said, I'll do three more classes specific for tomorrow teachers. And the commission actually pays the enrollment and the tuition for those students. So SIS is going to GCC for free. Right. And he's getting these college credits, which he can use for recertification. And will also ultimately end in a certificate from the commission mm -hmm. for teaching tomorrow. So the first class is the immersion methods. Anne-Marie teaches that. It's, it's all in tomorrow, which was so cool. I, when I sit in that class, it's like just hearing. It's tomorrow teachers. Mm -hmm. and, and tomorrow teachers also, some are more fluent. Right. And some are learning and they're getting into it, the younger ones, which is also really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but to sit in a class in Chamorro is just, it's such an experience. I, I, I walked out after, I, you know, I sat in a three-hour class and I, I walked out and I was like, already I'm a better speaker. I can tell. Already. Yeah. Um, and so that's the first class. The second class, I'm teaching it right now. It's um, best practices for literacy instruction. The idea behind this class is, like Sus said, <clears throat> there's not a lot of time devoted to Chamorro and GDOE. And they need more time if people are going to, students are, are going to get closer to fluency. Mm -hmm. So one of the approaches to getting more time is to look at how the Chamorro language can, imp learning the Chamorro language can improve students' literacy skills. Literacy skills are transferable across language. Right. If you're a strong reader in English, and you learn Spanish like I did, you're going to be, a, I'm a strong reader in Spanish because I know how to read and that transfers across any language. Right. And so what we want to do is increase the teaching of literacy skills within Chamorro classes. And once that is sort of widespread, then we can say, look, this is going to help them in their English classes mm -hmm. because they're learning literacy. Literacy is a foundation of all academic success, right? All academic skills need literacy mm -hmm. or all, all areas, right? Disciplines. So that's that class. We're exploring and I was, you know, we're exploring what are styles of Chamorro narratives. So we read all local literature. Some of it is in Chamorro. Some of it is in English. And we discuss it and we sit down and we look at it and we think, what is the Chamorro narrative? What is, what are, what do Chamorro writers uh, bring to literature because they're Chamorro. Right. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And we're also exploring this. The class itself explores the, I think of it as a paradox, but that's what we're exploring is, can you teach an oral, a, an indigenous oral traditional language through Western literacy methods? Right? Or is right. that taking away from the orality, from the, you know, is it, are we taking away from it? Right. I see it as a paradox because it seems contradictory, right? Mm -hmm. Like, no, this is an oral language. We got to teach it, um, you know, in oral ways. We got to teach it the way we learn. We can't use Western literacy methods to mm -hmm. teach it without changing it, without, you know, having problems. I see it as a paradox because I think we can, but I think we need to. To, to create it ourselves. We need to create the curriculum ourselves. We need to do it in the way that makes sense to us. Right. So that's the, the overall class is exploring, which is a theoretical thing, but they're creating books in Chamorro. That's the, what we're at right now, the writing process um, and literacy methods. The third class is called Chamorro Composition. Um, it's reading, writing, and orthography in Chamorro. So just like freshman composition, where you read samples of things and then you have to write essays, and then you go through the writing process and you revise those essays, mm -hmm. you're going to be doing that in tomorrow. Wow. And that class is also an immersion class. So right now, Jose Cruz is teaching it. It's starting the first time we're offering it is in the spring. These classes run as cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, and he's fluent in tomorrow. He's a weaver. He's also been teaching freshman composition for us at GCC for many years. Mm -hmm. He's a um, UOG faculty, actually. Um, and that's going to be another immersion class. How cool. You're going to be talking about what you're reading and, and issues around composition and revising in Chamorro. Right. And then the last class is about teaching history. So we really look at history as uh, canonical and outside of the canon. Mm -hmm. And so 
we are looking at cultural practices that still show history. So for example, All Souls Day, you're putting up wreaths at different um, graves. Well, there's history and genealogy there. Right. And so what cultural practices do we have that we can also learn history from? That's going to be an interviewing and, and talking to elders. That's going to be a part of it. And so the class is going to teach teachers how to create a history project mm -hmm. that's not just reading the same old canonical Guam history texts and regurgitating them. It's exploring history as a discipline and through people that we know mm -hmm. and then creating a project for students. So that's from start, which is the prompt. What is this project? Through revision and then through rubrics for grading it and everything. Oh. So that's the last class. Um, we're still, that class, my class is kind of half-half. No, it's more English, but the teachers present and talk in Chamorro often. Right. So that's the, that's kind of the trade-off. Um, it's very much that the teachers are the experts in the language mm -hmm. and I'm bringing the questions. Right. I'm creating the, I'm choosing the readings. I'm creating the class, but they're bringing that expertise. So, um, it's, it's a really, it's a nice balance. The classes are, are pretty dynamic and interesting so far. I think yours is like that too. Awesome. When I sat in on yours, it was cool. Everybody's laughing and talking and it's just nice to hear Chamorro in our hallway. Yeah. You go to the bathroom and people are speaking Chamorro. You're in the hallway. People are speaking Chamorro. It's like, right. it's nice. Yeah. And it's not an environment where people are critical of each other's speaking, yeah. right? We're all here to learn. We're all here to grow together yeah. as teachers. You know, no one's trying to compete. Right? Yeah. Like that. that safe space for language. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So. Yeah. Which is so important. Yeah. Um, she just finished giving a, like a whole breakdown of the immersion classes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't been to the last three yet, just the first. Um, oh, the three classes. You st so it's a cohort. So yeah. they're doing it one, two, three, four. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll let you know when I'm done. Well, what's the what's the experience like so far? Like, um, what's your take on kind of um, just the program in general? I love it. I love it. Um, I don't feel like I'm even in class. I feel like like stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in conversation with people. And it's in Chamorro, which is great. And it's also, it's people that are like me, they're Chamorro teachers, and they're all passionate about this. They all want to make Chamorro speakers. Um, and what a goal, right? What a dream. Um, what else can I say? Is it difficult? This is something I wonder about. For me, in my fluency level, um, understanding what's going on or a story or what I need to do is easier for me in Chamorro. It's very concrete. Mm -hmm. when, we, when the conversation changes to abstract ideas or like method, teaching methods in this case, mm -hmm. that vocabulary I don't have, that right. experience I don't have, right. in the class, does that ever come up where you're using, you have to use language in ways that's different than oh, the norm and absolutely. yeah absolutely and I would say you know even in if we're speaking English if yeah. there's stuff that I have no idea yeah. about right because we're coming at this we all you know have a at least a bachelor's degree right all this stuff but there are people that go to college and they have no idea what's going on yeah right? and they're they're speaking the language yeah so it's 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 that but it's also the fact that Chamorro is only recently now being brought into the academic level yeah. where it's you know in a college and we're talking about these abstract things right yeah. teaching teaching practices and stuff like that Chamorro you know for most of history has been used um, in everyday life which in some regards yeah. is scientific right we have seafaring culture that whole I would yeah. say a college of knowledge on seafaring culture that's developed in Chamorro but do we have a, a um, you know a huge vocabulary and things like outer space or in things like um, surgery, right? Maybe not. Or so, teaching. Yeah, or right? teaching. Like right? Western style teaching. Yeah, Western style teaching, for sure. You know, academia, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, definitely. That's something that people have to um, create. And there's there's yeah. a process to that. You know, there's grammatical stuff. And there's also, there's always going to be people that are like, what is that word? I've never heard of that word. That's an invented word. Yeah. But yeah, words are invented every day, right? Yeah. In English too. Right? Like, what is it when we're, um, there's so many words in English yeah. that are invented all the time that we hear. 
you know. Yeah, or changing words from a verb to a noun so that you can explain a concept. Right. That's something that hap that that is the development of a language. Mm -hmm. And the more developed the language gets, the more you can talk about science. Yeah. Like, that that's like the English language progressed like that, right? Right, right, right. Things yeah. condense. We notice that that our drinks are condensing, right? right? And then we make the jump to, ooh, let's talk about condensation then. Right, right, right. Now we can take condensation and put it in other, you yeah. know, we our, our discussion can change, mm -hmm. right? And right. so I think that's yeah. part of where we are with the Chamorro language is it's right. moving into new areas. Right. Even right. even in like the, so at the Fanadok and at PC Lohan, I think they're up to third grade now. Mm -hmm. So that is an immersion class of uh, one grade level of kids at a time every year they're adding one more right mm -hmm. so they're following that cohort up until probably sixth grade or so or maybe further up who knows where that will go but so even in that context they're they're they have to figure out what do we call uh, a, a hypothesis mm -hmm. what do we call um remainder what do we how mm -hmm. do we say you know three plus four I mean, maybe that's a little too simple, but you know, there are things like that. How do we say yeah. condensation? Yeah. Stuff like that. Because kids right. learn this stuff early on, right? In their science classes or whatever. So that that's a big challenge for them now is like, they are creating the curriculum as it as the kids come. You yeah. know, every year they have to add another yeah. year. But you know, in the future it'll be easier because at least, you know, all the groundwork will be laid down. But That's yeah. amazing though to think about that, right? Yeah. Is like you have to fill you have we have to take the existing language and adapt it and recreate in new contexts. Right. Like the the work of that. Yeah. I know Anne Marie works in that a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And and everyone at Haral as they as they do this. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's an exciting it's exciting yeah. thing, you know, to think about like there's just so much creation going on with Chamorro language right now, you know, with having to do the immersion and then when you're doing the immersion you're figuring out like mm, there's a lot of gaps that we need to like figure out with this right with condensation i don't know how that's like the big word of the last five minutes but condensation right <laughs> this is hot maybe you could say it's in hot. a pen <laughs> See? what yeah right, in a pen right in a yeah when you when you cook something and it like evaporates that means it's up and evaporated mm. so or we know that's the opposite because condensation is making water so evaporation would be in a pen and okay. then maybe Condensation would be uh, finet gun or something like that. Wetness. See, cre creating words, right? Yeah, there you go. But I think um, it, it reminds me of a conversation, a conversation we were having like before we were even filming was about just like creative writing, yes. um, in tomorrow and poetry, because um, you know, um, poetry, poetry in general is very um, it's very inventive, it's very expressive, um, abstract. Um, at times and you know I think there's sometimes where um, like you guys were talking about where um, someone will be like uh, I wouldn't use that word in that way you know or it's like mm, no one says that right. right but like you know that's kind of the thing with what we're talking about with language how you have to create words but it's also the thing about poetry is how um, you kind of um, you can also Poetry could be used to reinvent um, meaning. You're purposely using words outside of their context to create an idea. Well, and I think it, we got to think about English, poetry in English or other languages, and then poetry in Chamorro and right. the history. Mm -hmm. Because they are, it is creative. But you're making me think, Sus, that in this new, in this need to create, to use language in new contexts, which mm -hmm. will be creative, mm -hmm. there's going to be pushback. Right. So I know I've always, I've heard my mom say, <clears throat> I always talk about my mom. I love you, mom. But it's not always, you know, sometimes the more interesting things are negative. This isn't negative, but um, <laughs> just because earlier I was like, she's always scolding me. And, you know, oh, yeah. but but I've heard her say, you know, when certain people talk, I don't know what they're saying. I don't know what kind of Chamorro that is. Like, right. That's not Chamorro that I'm familiar with. Right. So there's going to be resistance because people who are fluent, yeah. like my mom is very fluent. Right are going to say, I, and it hurts my heart when I hear them say, oh, I don't know that language like that, or yeah. I don't know the orthography, so then I'm like not as good of a speaker, or you know what I mean? It yeah. kind of, right. but um, in our in our class, in the, the class right now, we're looking at poetry, and some Chamorro writers use Chamorro language in poetry in inventive, different ways, taking words out of context that they belong in, 
to fit a creative aesthetic or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my class, we were talking about that. And the teachers didn't like it. Mm -hmm. The teachers were like, no, that's wrong. Like, they can't. I understand what he's saying, but that's not, you know, that's not how we use. And so we had this big discussion on what is, you know, Chamorro poetry mm -hmm. and are the rules the same as in English poetry where there, there's no rules, basically. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, breaking the rules yeah. is what it, po a lot of poetry in English tries to do, right? Yeah. Create new ones. Mm -hmm. And so they were really discussing how, as Chamorro teachers as well, which is another level, keeping the language in its context or keeping it language so it can be understood without too much abstraction was important for them. But this is a question that all anyone who wants to write poetry in Chamorro or read poetry in Chamorro has to ask is how what what are the rules? Mm -hmm. Are we are we going to hold on to rules? Are we just going to adopt the because people talk a lot about Canton Chamorita, mm -hmm. which has rules, right. right? Yeah, there's rules to it. Yeah, um, that's a very creative expression, mm -hmm. right, of language and of thought and metaphor and ideas. Mm -hmm. Are we what are what are the rules of Chamorro poetry? Right. What is it going to be like? And right. it's good. It's going to be the writers that define it. Right. Because right now, I think we're just, I think we're just at a stage in like, um, language where we're just trying to f like hone in on the rules, figure out the rules, try to get the linguistics and just the composition and just all of it, and get everyone kind of on the same page. So when it comes to poetry, and where it's like, okay, well, mm, I don't care about the rules. It's like odd to exactly. a lot of people. Right. And I think um, it, it's reminding me of like this. I, I have I have this one poem. Right. And it's a it's here, it's Annie. A, oh, no, absolutely not. I will not be doing I will not be slamming any time in my near future. <laughs> I think it's a loss to the world. Um, and It will stay lost. It will be a hidden treasure for sure. No, I mean, it'll come out eventually. But um, um. As much as I wish I didn't send it, it's already out. It's going to be out in the world. You know, I cannot take it back. It's forever in the internet. Yeah, yeah um, but um, it was um, it was for Storyboard, right? And I... Which, which volume? Um, the volume that's not published. Nah, the one that's not out yet or okay. something like that. I don't know when they'll ever okay. let it out. Maybe maybe it's going to be a lost volume. Who knows? We're working on it right now. Yeah, right? Um, but... Um, the thing about the the poem that I have for that is that it's a uh it's a it's a, okay it's a word concept right so it's a English poem it's written it's an English poem but in tomorrow and the way I'm like describing it is like it's um I don't want to get too deep in it because that's not the point but the poems like um I wrote it with the English mindset so the whole poem is about like um it's about language and it's about it's called like in the parentheses talking about how like this poem um you know there's the tomorrow on top and then under under it is in the parentheses which is the english and i was just talking about like you know this poem's like written in english but i wish i wish i knew what it was like to be the the main thing on top there yeah. you know kind of like that and the reason why i bring that up is because um the editing process of it was really interesting right so I wrote it in English and I was just like, I'm gonna have my I'm gonna have my friend. I'm gonna have my friend Vince. Vince Campo, hi, I love you, I miss you. I miss you, Vince. We all miss you, even though they don't know you. Well, Hesos misses you too. Um, but um I had him write it and I didn't he, I didn't give him like anything. Um I didn't give him like any like rules or structure. I was just like, do whatever you want, just like translate it, whichever way you want to translate it, right? Because in its own way, um in my perspective, I feel like translating is in itself its own form of poetry because it's like you have to choose your words. Yeah. You know, you you envision what this English word will be like and everyone can like say it. No, I would use this word for that. No, this feels this word feels better. You know, this like flow, not just flows, but I feel like internally this is what you really yeah. want to say. You know, so in that way, translation is kind of poetry. Mm -hmm. So I let him do his own creative reins on that. But, you know, during the like editing process with Storyboard, um, 
I met with someone and they pretty much changed the whole thing, right? And well, not the English, but it's tomorrow. But like I, we were talking through it and I was like, okay, I get it, right? But at the same time, it was funny because it was like the, the whole point of the poem is I don't know tomorrow. So I'm just kind of like, in my head, I was like, okay, go help. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, whatever. But then it went through a second tomorrow translator and then they dis- that person disagreed with the edits that was edited and then I was just like let me go to someone else who's like I know is so like really great at tomorrow and they're like oh I would take I would take edit one for this section edit two for this section but I really love what three's doing and I'm like <laughs> I was like mm, tomorrow's hard <laughs> I'm like oh I don't I don't get it, but then that that's the complication with Chamorro poetry, I feel, is because, like, people, um, well, of course the rules, but then people um, are very, I think, are very protective of words sometimes and be like, no, it should be this way. It's the Chamorro contradiction where everyone says there's different ways to speak Chamorro. It's an oral language. You go to this island, it's different. You go down south, it's different. And they acknowledge that, and then on the other hand, they say, but this is the right way. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm right. There's so many ways you can say this, but I'm right. Yeah, and it's a country. It's like so when it comes to poetry, the contradiction doesn't become the actual poem. Now the contradiction of Chamorro poetry is just the wording itself, and not like you're not actually like I feel like some people don't even like you would want the poem the discussion of the poem to be about the contents of the poem, but now it's becoming just of the creation of the poem and the wording of the poem, you know? The issue there is is editing. So editing, so that's also my background is like, is responding to student writers, which is editing mm-hmm. to a certain extent. Editors, depending on, it, it takes just like any other craft, it takes experience, training, time to be a good editor. Editors, you don't want to take the person's idea and change it and make it your own. You want to find out what the writer is saying and you want to bring it out. You want to help them. You want to present your questions. And so I think Chamorro translation and Chamorro editing is also a new field for us on Guam. And so everyone that's editing approaches it from their own. I think this is what I would, you know what I mean? But without that kind of maybe Mm -hmm. without that thought about what is the role of an editor and what is the role of language and what is the role of poetry and what is the role of the author mm-hmm. and what is my role as an editor? And yeah. I think that sounds like that's also another issue there is that it's not, you know. This is a new field for new tomorrow. Field you need to like, it's, it's exciting in that sense. Mm-hmm. Everything, uh, not everything, a lot of things are new and new to me is always fun because it's a challenge. It's not plateaued. It's constant growth, which mm-hmm. is constant growth for everybody. Right. I think in this conversation, now that like, I'm so sorry, Hassus, you know what? I'm realizing I'm so sorry. You know what? How rude of me. I'm going to stay quiet after this opinion and I will not, I will not have any more opinions after this, Hassus. I promise. Thank you. That's not a promise I can keep, but I'm just going to say that for right now. All right. Okay. But, um, damn, I lost my train of thought. Oh, okay. So like through this conversation, it's just like, I feel like with every problem that arises, even though like it's a problem and it's just like, um, like, yeah, there's this problem now with, um, you know, now we have to figure out this. I find, like, every time there's a new problem um, with Chamorro language, I think it's exciting because it's just like, that means we found something, you know? That means we, there's a new thing we can, there's a new step we can take, you know? It means that we're not done yet. It means that, like, because I don't think that, you know, I don't think it's, you know, there's no real end goal because language is dynamic, right? So there's always going to be a new finish line, a new finish line. Exercise. You're yeah. just constantly exercising. Our brains are getting right. So if we don't see, if we don't see a problem, it's because we're not really trying. You know. So every time we see a problem, I'm like yes, great. Like now we can like, you know, make make this so much better. You yeah. know. But I will. You know what? Putting it down. Right. Passing the it's mic. Right. It's all right. <laughs> uh, just on the, the point of, you know, there are different ways that people speak Chamorro, right? Yeah. And how people can yeah. get territorial over the language. You see that in every, at all of these passion jobs, right? Chamorro teachers, healers, seafarers. Everyone thinks that they do it the only right way. Yeah. And everyone else has no idea what they're doing, right? So that's something that I think is very... Um, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's it's in all those areas, and in some ways, maybe it does make us better, right? Maybe it does sharpen iron. Sharp, iron sharpens iron, and and whatever. 
but I think it also detracts. Yeah. And it also gets us. It's divisive. It, it's divisive, and it it gets us away from our goal, which is to heal, which is to perpetuate the language, which is to um, perpetuate the 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 study of seafaring, right, and the practice of it. So it's like, and I can go on. There are other ways, you yeah. know, other places where they do that. But yeah, it's just such a big thing that we as a community need to work through. Yeah. We need to let it, each other live, and we need to help each other if we have criticism. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I think is it is it is one of the ways that we can help achieve these goals is to start with something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I had to say, Annie. Thank you. No, and I'm so glad I gave you that time. You deserve that time. You know, just tell me, be quiet. You know, just like push my mic down. <laughs> right. It's almost like it's competition. But in this, in in most of these areas, there's no need for the competition yet. Mm -hmm. It's like these are wide open spaces right. where everybody working in these spaces is gonna can contribute stuff mm -hmm. and let time and and tell who's gonna you know which right. ideas are gonna surface and go through. That that naturally happens. Mm -hmm. But we can't be pulling each other down as we're trying to do this work. We right. really do need to just support, respect, let it happen. Um, and 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 listen and talk to each other and yeah. see what we can get from each other, right? Yeah. Grow together because man, yeah. it, you see it so much. You see yeah. it all the time, and it, it's it's not helping any ever anyone. We can't say that our goal, our passion, is to perpetuate anything mm -hmm. while we're cutting down other people who also have that same goal but different methods, right? Or perspective or language use. It right. it, it it's count contradictory. Yeah, like why are you running? to compete and win when the track isn't even laid out yet. Right. The track's not laid out, and when it's laid out, there's a hundred lanes. Right. So the five of you can right. spread out, you know? Right. It doesn't, it's, it's, right. it's, we're not in like where there's like just a niche, mm -hmm. or one little niche, and whoever's going to fill that niche first is going to, you know, mm -hmm. monopolize everything. We're not there, right. you know? Right. Yeah. And there's also an issue of people, you know, that, this is something I see as well that people use these these jobs as maybe their their primary goal is not necessarily to contribute to the goal. It's to look good, or it's mm. to come off as Self. someone yeah someone that cares a lot. But in reality, what what is the work that they really do, other than modeling, as some would say? You know what I mean? So it, that's another issue too. Is like we need to find out who these people who is actually contributing to these goals, and who is just there for the picture, right? Yeah. That's another thing. <laughs> we have that discussion in our class because we're looking, we look at different metaphors in literature and then we think and we try to, you know, so we're, Annie and I, and I know you took class with Larry Regatol, we're doing the seafaring, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just waiting to bring my class to talk to him because uh, one of those metaphors is, is the canoe, mm -hmm. navigating, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is when we look at our metaphors or our, our concepts? What are the actual applications that are there, and how does that deepen the metaphor? Right. And so another one that we just talked about is Sina. You know this, which when I was growing up, I don't ever really remember my mom call, using Sina as a title for right. anyone. Right. It was like Tan, you know, yeah. or Tun, or. Yeah. But uh, now Sina is a big right. concept, mm -hmm. and people call themselves Sina or are called Sina or, you know, use, and, and Sina as teacher. I know Harau uses Sina as teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I, one of their assignments the last class was define Sina, define it in what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. Who are some examples? Mm -hmm. How would you not, when would you not apply the term Sina to someone? Mm -hmm. And, and then they, they wrote those essays out, their short essays. Um, and then we talked about it yeah. and it was really interesting because some, most people thought of Sina as someone who is a model, who teaches you. Mm -hmm. So some people said, um, one, one of the students is from Luta. So she said, I was taught that everyone is my elder. Everyone is my Sina. Mm -hmm. If they don't return the respect for me, I back away. Mm -hmm. But that never excuses my behavior towards them. They're still Sina. Right. And then another a younger <clears throat> student said, like with teachers, if they don't give me respect, if they if they are, you know, or they don't do their job or they don't care, <clears throat> I, I don't have the innate respect for them. Right. Like in terms of calling them Sina. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said, I'll respect, I, of course, always respect the elders to whatever degree, but they're not Sina. Mm -hmm. Right. And then another teacher said, another student in the class who's their teachers said, younger people, I sometimes think of as Sina. 
because they when they teach me something about life that I didn't really understand and I know that I can get a different perspective for them mm. I, I and I was like well I've never thought about younger people being uh, considered Saina by someone and this man is an older gentleman you know he's and and so it's it's I think investigating these terms and these concepts that we use often mm -hmm. and are now part of our mainstream you know list of metaphors or list of concepts right um, and and that's one thing that we do in the class is how do we define it and, and it's good to know what people expect mm -hmm. from role models and one of the other last thing I'll say is that to boil it down it really came to, to the sense of Sina's also needing to empower. Mm -hmm. And so there was some talk about that, about someone can, can tell you everything and model and, sh you know, but if, if there's no sense of empowerment or if you don't see, if, if, if you don't feel empowered by what they do, even if it's not directly from what they do, it's just kind of how they are, then they're not you know, some people felt that that's not really a Sina thing, that that's part of Sina's role mm. is to empower, right? Like not to just sort of delegate or turn everything into Tentagu work. Right. Because I think we see that a lot. I feel uh, that a lot is all of a sudden for some people, I just feel like Tentagu, what can I do? But when it comes to my idea, when it comes to my passion or what I want to do, you know, it's not supported. I see. So, yeah. So, I guess, gosh, what a great conversation. I mean, I feel like we could we could sit under this tree for, like, another five hours, honestly, and not be bored. But I think to wrap it up, I think we talk, we've talked a lot about um, uh, issues, and we've laid out some, um, some um, ways forward. But I think to um, just final thoughts about uh, where we go from here. Right. I think the I mean, obviously, the the immersion class. But what do you see after, you know, the immersion class? Right. Or what do you see for yourself? Right. Not just after the immersion class, but what do you even see for um, the future of your students or the students in on Guam with language in general? I know such a big question I had to ask at the end. Yeah. I think as far as the dream of reinvigorating the language there's so much work to be done and I think I'm blessed honestly that this is the life I get to live and this is what yeah. I can contribute with my one life um, as far as you know what specifically we can do we can try to learn we speak in, we can try to speak and learn Chamorro in all of our contexts right I think it's beautiful that GCC they have meetings in Chamorro that's great but you know continue to create in the language continue to learn the language if you can continue especially babies the youngest ones, they pick it up so easily. And if, you know, that's that's the easiest way to teach is, is make it their first language. Um, that's one thing. I think that in order to for the language to really survive, we need to expand this idea of immersion school. There needs to be not just one immersion school, yeah. there needs to be many immersion schools. Yeah. But also intrinsically, you know, are people motivated to learn the language? We need to remember who we are as a people. We need to foster the love for our people, for our history, for our ancestors, right? And there's so many people that do that mm -hmm. already. But that's something that can continue to grow and continue to inspire young people. Um, I think Chamorro also has to, you know, meet the challenges of the modern age. So we're talking yeah. about bringing Chamorro into, the, into college, right? Into abstract um, concepts and mm -hmm. abstract, you know, fields and stuff like that, which is great. Um, there's so much that we can do. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, we can be a part of it in the future. And I hope, you know, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. So <laughs> hopefully I can be, you know, 80 years from now, 105, still teaching middle school until I'm middle school. <laughs> or at least, you know, I'm expanding. I would like to expand what I do. I would like to make resources. I would like to yeah. teach online. And I, I already teach online, but, you know, expand that. Reach out to people that, Chamorros that have, you know, moved to other move to the, the states or, or other countries and stuff like that to, con to reinforce those bonds and, you know, make, make Chamorro as useful, as interesting, as exciting as any other language that will survive into the modern age. So there's a lot that we could do. <coughs> um, I think 
so first of all, here's my plug, right? If you know any Chamorro teachers, let them know about this program. It's free. It's not going to be free for for ever. It's free right now. We still have two more cohorts coming up. Um, and I think for me, and I and I agree with you. I I feel like I feel very blessed to be working in an area that I that I'm driven by passion about, because I think you know it's it's a lot of people. Uh, it's easy to fall into routines or jobs that we don't love. And it's like, I was just listening. It's like 13 years of your life is spent at work, you know? So, and then you only, the only thing you do more than that is sleep. Right. And so to turn, so this is what I want always for my students is for them to find something that is worth 13 years of their life. That's going to help them grow. That's going to, um, be fulfilling. And as an educator, um, and I talked a little bit about educational reform that's a big area for me so this tomorrow program is part of what I do but I teach English so I'm working with students coming in who don't like writing don't necessarily get read that much right and who are mostly convinced that they're not good at it which is the big hurdle that I work out over you know is is let's break out this idea that you're not good at something let's figure out you know so for me educational reform and I think really I call it, or I think of it as decolonizing education, not, our political decolonization is something else, of course, under this decolonization umbrella, but for me, decolonizing education is, is important because I think that's how we have a successful education system. I think that until, until we're, uh, and people are working in this, you know, uh, creating curriculum, there's lots of little pockets, and then there's some bigger efforts. But until we truly have an education system that meets our needs and, and our demographics and uh, is what we want and what we choose, until, that, until that's happening more, we're going to continue to see low test scores. We're going to continue to have, this, have so many students understanding that, that college is not for them, that they're not good at school, that the military is their only option for success, that school is boring, reading, you know, all of these kinds of uh, negative behaviors towards towards learning, right? Because you don't have everyone doesn't have to go to college, but everyone should care about learning and improving their life and and finding what fulfills them and stuff like that. I mean, to me, that's what happiness is about. And so, how can we redo our education system so that we're meeting the needs of more students and 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 allowing people who are passionate in an area like teaching language to actually fulfill that passion and not have to do all of this other stuff around it that isn't that's detracting from that mission and goal so but i do feel very lucky i feel like a lot of my experience in life have led me here and i think that's the best that we can all hope for is that we're using everything that we've got towards our mission you know um, and I feel very lucky to have had you guys here today you know I think it was such a a great conversation and I feel like um, I feel like we all just learned something um, not just the viewers but I feel like you know I feel like we we always learn something with every conversation we have with people that kind of um, share the spaces or even in, especially in like for me you know I'm not really in the same language space as you guys so this was just like um you know my free class if anything <laughs> um but yeah thank you again so much for coming and um thank you everyone for sticking around and listening again this was um a beautiful conversation on tomorrow language here at Fanatsu podcast don't forget to check us out on facebook instagram twitter spotify again apple podcasts maybe, maybe. um that is some research you got to do by yourself um Wow. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um I'm sure we're there. If not, um I'll um we'll get we'll get there eventually. But uh and also don't forget to check out our Patreon for all the extra exclusive content. Um but for now, uh I'll see you again next time. Right. Bye. And if you remember Sus's word for condensation, comment below. <laughs> I think, or it, it might be condensation, it might be evaporation. It might be evaporation. You know what? He gave a word for both. You yeah. know, a price yeah, to the yeah, first person. Eh? It. So it's uh, when, when you cook something and it evaporates, that's appen. Appen. But isn't condensing, 
condensation also when the air condenses into water? Yes, when it's like so maybe cold that's, that's and why I'm thinking heat as mixing well. together and so, producing. So that might be inapan. Mm. Or finet good wetness. Add that to your vocabulary, everyone. Make fetch happen. Make or at least open happen. Open that conversation. Yeah. See what your family would call Ask it. Ask your nana what yeah. she would call it. Yeah. Maybe she'll say, who is that guy? What is he talking he about? He doesn't know anything. anything. Or maybe she'll agree, exactly. you know? But let's have that conversation, right? Uh, until next time, you know? I'll, maybe, maybe they'll be back. Maybe, maybe not. But we'll see you again. We will still be talking now, so. But we'll still be under this tree. So if you know where Simone lives, um, come by. But I'm just kidding. Don't. Please don't. If you guys recognize this tree, don't you dare come by. Respect her privacy. Okay. Call me first. Call her first? Okay. Bye. For real this time. Eh. Viva Chamorro. Viva!